Now, as usual, I am so delighted to be here and that you have joined us on time. Uh, before we begin with introductions, let's give everyone just about a minute or two to tune into the live stream. Uh, meanwhile, folks, you know my favorite question, which is, where's everyone tuning in from today? And uh, if you'd like to vary it up a bit, uh, I'm curious if you've read any interesting quantum news or quantum papers, preprints on the archive. So feel free to post the link and I'll try to take a look afterwards. Uh, it will be interesting to see what folks are seeing and reading these days. Last time we mentioned that the uh, Kiskit Global Summer School is coming up and uh, I hope you signed up. It seems that we might be at full capacity now. But look forward to it. I believe all the videos will be posted online afterwards. I'm really excited about it. We'll be talking about quantum noise and simulations. Uh, it will be it'll be a thing to be at. So folks, uh, I see that we have uh, folks here from Yorktown, France, San Diego, California, uh, also California, uh, Oregon, and so on. Now, just to give you a reminder, the seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this Kiskid YouTube channel. You can always go back and catch up on anything you missed, but we can only ask questions here live during the chat and the seminar in the comment chat box. Uh, please interrupt me and all this as often as possible. You can folks uh, discuss and answer each other's questions as well during the seminar. So with that, I think it's time we get going. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Ole Stanko, my good colleague from IBM, on quantum simulations of topological Majorana modes. Oles uh, received his PhD degree from MIT in 2019 and has been part of the quantum computing theory group at IBM since uh, 2001. All this is current interests include quantum simulations, quantum algorithms, and the effect of noise in quantum systems in particular with emphasis on near-term applications of quantum computing in science and tech. So with that, all this, welcome to the IBM Kiskit seminar. How are you today? Um, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. I'm very excited. I feel very excited about this talk and I would like to uh, also thank everybody for joining the seminar. I hope it will be interesting and insightful. And today I will be talking about uh, quantum simulations, uh, which it becomes very, became very popular uh, topic um, uh, in the last years, and in particular, I will be talking about quantum simulations of topological uh, Majorana modes. A uh, few notes, uh, this work is done here at IBM, um, and it uses Qiskit uh, as, a, as a main tool to perform experiments on uh, IBM hardware, so I think um, at the end, I will, I will, uh, I will show you uh, that using uh, basically uh, tools we have at uh, IBM, you can actually uh, compete with uh, world-class experimental groups developing own hardware. Um, so, and my talk will consist of four parts. And first part will be introduction, where I'll try to motivate you uh, why um, topological phases of matter are interesting, why should we care about simulating them, them on uh, quantum hardware. And the second uh, part, I will explain a little more about uh, Majorana mode detection and very interesting technique, how we can extract uh, existence of this uh, exotic particle from our multi-qubit device. And the next step, I will show you brand new method of braiding and I explain what it is and uh, why it's important. And in the last uh, part, if we have time, I will briefly introduce how you can uh, distinguish this topological Majorana modes from some other types of modes which can exist in the systems. And my um, talk will have a lot of uh, condensed matter language and I will try to be very uh, descriptive of uh, what, what words uh, mean what uh, in, in this context. <clears throat> But before that, I would like to put uh, my our work in the context of uh, development of technology. And now we have access with uh, devices of, of size of hundreds of qubits. 
And this is very exciting. And I think we already passed the threshold when we can replace some uh, classical computations and quas classical simulations with a quantum computer. I think it's very exciting era uh, we entered in. However, the problems we want to solve with our quantum devices, um, they have to mark some uh, criteria because we don't yet have a fault tolerant quantum computing. And, um, and this criteria is, first of all, of course, it should be efficiently solved, cannot be, cannot be efficiently solved classically, otherwise we don't need quantum computer for that. They require constant log depth and this is why uh, this is because of noise. Um, the algorithms we apply we should should respect the device connectivity. We cannot apply any gates uh, we want. We have only limited set of them. And in particular, the result should be meaningful for um, for using only dozens of hundreds of qubits. So we we cannot have a problem which has input of thousands of qubits <clears throat> so far. And, and uh, the promising directions um, is the quantum simulations and particular quantum simulations of condensing matter and chemistry problems. And I will focus on the uh, first topic and I will try to show uh, quantum simulations of condensing matter in particular topological phases. But before that, I would like to uh, motivate you why topological phases is, is interesting direction. And for me, the exciting exciting because they break down the concept of reductionisms in physics. So in few words, what it does mean? It means, uh, reductionisms in physics means that you, you can take a complex object and understand the dynamics using smaller and simpler fundamental parts. For example, if you have a material, you can understand material as a combination of atoms. If you have atoms, you can understand them as a combination of proton and neutron, and so on, so on, so on, until you go to the level of elementary particles. And this approach helped us a lot during uh, development of physics. But in late 20, 19, uh, sorry, in uh, um, late twentieth century, we figure out that it's not always the case. And that happened with develop uh, with discovery of topological phases. Let me give you one minute uh, um, history of this. So in 1980s, uh, Klaus von Klitzing and his team was experimenting with two-dimensional uh, electronic gas in, and they put it in very, very strong magnetic field. And they, 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 their um, goal was study a whole resistance. It's um, just resistance of the device, which should linearly depend on magnetic field. But what they surprisingly found is that the resistance they measure, it instead of rising linearly, at strong fields gets the strange, strange plateaus you can see on this plot. And each plateau correspond to a uh, integer number. And that was very interesting effect, which nobody's seen before. And it was quickly people quickly realized that you can explain it by assuming that well, electrons in the in the bulk of the gas, they kind of locked in, in uh, cyclotron orbits, which created the magnetic field, while there are only few electrons which run at the edges of the device. And if you apply uh, laws of quantum mechanics to this uh, edge electrons, you can actually explain this plateau formation. But that was a pretty interesting effect. It's called integer quantum Hall effect. But lately, it was found that if you increase magnetic field, you will see the plateaus happening even for fractional number, uh, uh, not integers, but fractional numbers. And the only explanation you can get from this is that you have somehow particles with fractional charge. And if you follow the just adductionism logic, this means that somehow electrons splits up into multiple more elementary particles with uh, fractional charge. However, this is not the case, of course. Robert Laughlin in the 80s I was able to show that uh, collective motion of electrons, like all electrons in your system, can create a excitations which behave like uh, electron with a, with a particle with fractional charge. And this opened a new page in, 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 in um, not only condensing metaphysics, I think it opened a page in physics in general. What is more, in, more interesting about this uh, particular particles is they also have a, what we call uh, um, uh, a non-trivial 
statistics. So you know all the particles in the world we, we have deal with, they can be either bosons or fermions. And in terms of quantum mechanics, if you take two bosons and you swap position of two bosons, you will get the same state. While if you two, take two fermions and swap their positions, you will get minus sign in front of wave function. So what is interesting about these particles, swapping position of two particles will give you any phase. This phase particles get an, named anions. And um, what, what is more, more and more interesting is that some of these particles have even more complicated behavior. If you take these two particles and swap their position, you not only get a state which is uh, which is get a phase, but it's it's a completely different state. And if you take the collection of these particles and keep swapping these particles, eventually you will generate a subspace in your Hilbert space, such that each uh, basis of this subspace is a code word. Um, and what it means, it means that if you take these two states and sandwich it uh, with, with a, some local operator, it gives an exponentially small quantity, which means that the quantum information you store in the state will be reliably protected from environmental noise. That's why the non-abelian anions uh, was this kind are extremely interesting from perspective of quantum computing. And one of the most prominent examples of this uh, uh, particle, uh, non-abelian anions, um, Mayana fermions. So remember from the previous slide, I was told you that uh, these particles behave as a part of electron. So Mayana fermions behave as a half of electron. So uh, if you take operator that creates or annihilates electrons, you can always uh, always show it as a, as a sum of two of these Majorana particles. These particles were named after Ettore Majorana, a physicist with very um, sad sad uh, li life life story. But the particles he proposed early in 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 twentieth century they remain a big challenge. For example, we try to find it in quantum Hall effect, but it's still up to date. We don't have a good proof that they exist there. Oh, and, yeah, sure. A quick um, maybe connection to some earlier episodes of the Kiski seminar series. We had a number of talks on cat states and how they get used for protecting quantum information. and. Um, it, there and you kind of also have either that or, or you know hexagonal uh codes or gkp codes in particular and you have you tend to have again some of this basis that satisfies this exp, uh, you know exponential decay uh and that's how we use to protect quantum information um mm -hmm. so i guess that's once if, you know can, can you maybe draw some similarities or distinctions for us between these non-abelian anions and maybe some of you know more general quantum states that could even be within one mode um, that might have a similar basis. Um, I guess the statistics are, for instance, very different. But uh, I thought it might be a good connection to make. Well, well, uh, I don't know if you, uh, our audience is uh, familiar with uh, with the toy code, uh, for example, and uh, in in, uh, in the toy 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 code. Um, you basically um, have any 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 error. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in Tori code, you have excitations which are also anions. So, if you are, um, you 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 can set up um, if you if you have a set of errors, then uh, you you can always uh, present it as a formation of of pairs of 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 this. Of the anions, um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm thinking about maybe better, better explanation. We can also punt it to the uh, end of of the talk if you want. Uh, there was a quick question from the audience here from Rafael. Uh, can you think of these particles as somewhere between a boson and a fermion? Uh... Yeah, you may think about. So you may think um, this uh, Majorana fermions as a kind of superposition of uh, electron and hole, for example. 
So um, yeah, you, it, there is a way to think about them as a superposition of fermions, for example, or, or more complicated superposition of bosons. Okay, thank you very much, Oles. So, um, and while we had a big problem with finding these particles um, in um, uh, quantum Hall effect, in early 2000, um, Kitaev, Alexey Kitaev came up with a model of a simple one-dimensional system where these modes appear automatically. So uh, what, what did Alexey consider? He considered a one-dimensional model and he considered is a chain is a chain uh, of, of of sites where at which site where where we can have a, a fermion, and then he divided each each fermion or each electron into two Mayana, as we did it in the previous slide, and wrote the Hamiltonian which couples each Mayana to its nearest neighbor. And for convenience, we separate coupling uh, of uh, Odd, even and odd Mayanas, like gamma 2 and gamma 3, and coupling of uh, odd even, like gamma 3 and gamma 4, as two separate terms. And it was, you can show that in these models, if your H coupling of this term is smaller than J, you always have two Mayana modes, two Mayana particles sitting at the edges of, of this chain in a, in a ground state. And that, that is, is amazing property. Um, and mathematically, you can express this as a, a presence of operator, we call it Mayana mode operator, which commutes with Hamiltonian. And this Mayana operator, which we denote as a capital gamma, uh, this gamma L and gamma right, they behave the same way as the fundamental fermions in the previous slide. And our goal in this presentation will try to reproduce the system on IBM quantum hardware and try to detect these modes and see how they look like. And it's, it's very exciting. So we will have a very, very little insight except of that this mode exists and still, still will be able to recover them. But before I do that, I would like to uh, mention a rocky history of trying to realize this Hamiltonian in uh, uh, solid state devices. So it was shown that you can make similar Hamiltonian, not exactly the same, but similar Hamiltonian in, uh, if you take a one-dimensional nanowire and put it in a superconductor in a strong magnetic field. And that, um, you can, in this system, you can probe this Mayana modes if you take this nanowire and drive a current through it. And if you are, um, have a modes, this Mayana mode sitting at the edges, Experiment predicted that you have a sharp peak in conductivity. And this peak is, was indeed observed, which created a lot of buzz in this area uh, around uh, 2012. However, it was lately realized that we can have more than one reason for getting these uh, edge modes. And that created two um, even fewer attractions of notable uh, papers and up to this day, we still don't have, though we have remarkable progress, up to this day, we still don't have a reliable way to uh, to say if we see this Mayana modes or not on these devices. And in this talk, I will try to address this problem in context of quantum simulations. So tune in the end, I will try to answer this question. Finally, uh, once we detect Mayana modes, it will be interesting to try to braid them. And if you remember, uh, if you have a braiding, you can implement topological quantum computing. While we cannot do topological quantum computing in the with the um, our qubit devices for a number of reasons, um, I can explain them at the end. We can still mod uh, simulate how it would look like in this in the real devices. So it's very important to have a way to exchanges particles just on our device. And traditionally, um, uh, how specialists in the field think about this is um, that you can create a Hamiltonian that slowly moves this particle around each other. So if UT is a basically evolution of your system under this, this very, very slowly changing Hamiltonian, it takes this uh, left Mayana operator, it converts in a right operator, 
and taking right operator converts it into left operator with the phase which is minus one. And this is phase we get minus one. Uh, it's the case get, phase which we get bringing two Mayana modes. And interesting, if we have four Mayana modes using the same, the same procedure, we can actually realize uh, topological quantum computing on, on a real device. <clears throat> However, in one dimension, there is a big problem. In one dimension, if you try to slowly exchange to Mayanas, you will get a collision problem because at some point you have to pass them through each other, which which is uh, impossible to do because they start interacting and destroy the process. So there is a standard solution, and the standard solution is just adding some another dimension, another nanowire or some space where you can safely store your Mayana mode. However, that will require even more complicated Hamiltonians, even more complicated uh, and long time dynamics, including the fact that you have to do it very long for a long time because Hamiltonians are changing slowly. So what our goal is, is to propose a new adiabatic technique, a non-adiabatic technique, so non-slow technique that allows us to do it one dimension without attaching any additional nanowires. And that's again, that's something I will explain during this talk. Quick question, Oles. Um, what's the time scale that sets what slow means? Oh, it's a very good question. So um, this Mayana mode, uh, the, the Mayana modes, um, uh, we, we, in condensed physics, we sell, they, they sit in the gap, which means if you think about it, frequencies, the Mayana mode has a zero frequency in the next next excitations to Mayana, it has some finite frequency. So we have a kind of frequency separation between Mayana mode and 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 as an other other excitations in the system, which we call gap. So our our uh, Hamiltonian uh, should be uh, changing on a time scale, which which is. Um, um, larger than inverse gap, one over this uh, difference in frequency between uh, Mayana mode and the rest mode of the system. And that way we we make sure that we do not convert this Mayana mode into other excitations. And the gap is set by H and J and the size of the chain? Uh, gap is not depend on the size of the chain. So it's some universal property of the model. I mean, it, it depends, but as you increase the system size, it quickly saturates to some value. So it based, mainly depends on H and J, and if you have more terms in Hamiltonian, as other terms Hamiltonian as well. In other words, you don't have a you, you, should, you don't have a pinching problem of the gap, where you know the gap tends to get smaller with something, and so then you have to go even slower. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in this case, uh, in contrast to regular uh, quantum, what they call quantum annealing, yeah, we don't we don't have this problem. But still, it's it's a, it's a little bit complicated when we uh, we try to implement near term quantum devices. So I I wasn't I'm not aware about any uh, experiment uh, except of just like two qubit experiments where you can do it. Um, reliably. And I will show you that with our technique, we can do it uh, much, much faster. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Olis. Uh, just to let you know, we're 25 minutes in. Great. Thank you. So yeah, uh, so our agenda is to observe Mayana modes. Uh, so constructed circuit and after processing, get the Mayana mode information. Um, we would like to exchange and break Mayana modes. And finally, we would like to have a technique that separates trivial modes and my modes. So I will go straight to my animal detection. So um, that's how our device look like. It's um, for example, layout, layout of uh, IBM uh, Toronto device. And it's those not one dimensional. Therefore we somehow need to cut a one dimensional piece of this. And one of possible ways is as shown here. So we have a snake. So basically, qubit 11 is first qubit, qubit 8, second qubit, and so on. So the first step of our simulation. So this simulation, I guess, uh, contains 21 one, one qubit. And uh, next, 
uh, step is to uh, encode our Mayana fermion, oper Mayana fermion operators as as a uh, um, Pauli operators which we with which we act on on, on qubits. So um, and we can do it with using uh, what is called Jordan Wigner transformation, where we put in correspondence to each uh, Mayan operator. There are two of them per qubit as a long string uh, of Z operators like this. Uh, where at the end, uh, it ends up with X operator for odd gammas and Y operator for uh, even gammas. So, for example, if you encode, want to want gamma 1, it will be just X on the first qubit. If you encode, want to encode gamma, say, 5, it will be, um, it will need uh, K equal 3, so it will be X on this qubit and Z and Z and Z on this three qubits. Um, Sorry, a few quick questions, maybe quick responses. Usually, Jordan Wigner, you think of fermions, not anions. Um, maybe just a quick comment there. Yeah, yeah. So, so this two two particles. So, if you consider only two uh, particles, that that's a, a bit subtlety. So, uh, if you think about uh, two two myana, they uh, two two myana particles, they behave uh, as a fermion to each other. So, um, but if you have more than two myanas, which will be uh, will require a little bit more complicated transformations that will, will behave the anion. So, uh, so, so number of matters. So hopefully for, for two Majorana particles, we can, we can think about them as fermions. Okay. Gotcha. But after that, uh, can you still use the Jordan Wigner or you have to do something else? Yeah. You, uh, it's, if, if you want to model a uh, full, full quantum computing, uh, with, with, uh, with many years and two Majoranas, you will need to think about something else. But that, that's much more complicated problems that uh, I think will be natural next step for, for uh, our research. So, so far we have only two of them. So they, they give us only minus one statistics so we can think about them as fermions. Um, uh, okay. Um, so we have these two operators which are, are non-local, but uh, uh, hopefully, uh, thankfully, if we have two of them and we have like, the product of all even and odd we have they they can be converted as product of x operators while if we take the product of odd and even it just from into z operators and you can do this exercise you just multiply these two operators so you 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 can uh encode your uh, kitaev's model as a local um x x and z operator and it's, it's very widely known uh transformation between a Kitaev chain and what we call quantumizing model. And our goal will be implementing this quantumizing model. Uh, moreover, in our dynamics, we will take this quantumizing model and add some interactions. And the role of this interaction is following because we, this, this operator, this Hamiltonian is um, what we call free fermion Hamiltonian. It can be solved class efficiently a classical computer. We eventually want a problem that is not classical solvable. So that's one motivation to add in this term. But also this motivation is that in, if we want maybe in the future, in the near future to simulate real quantum devices, we would have to include these terms as well. So that's why we added this ZZ interaction term to, to increase the general, to generalize the problem. And um, I, I make a notation for each such term for convenience and if we want to implement such dynamics on a quantum computer, uh, which operates with discrete gates, we need to use the Suzuki total decomposition uh, in this form. So we decompose the evolution under this Hamiltonian as a product of uh, small short time evolutions for each term that's repeated T divided delta T times. However, th this approach has a little bit problem, it has a little problem. Uh, the problem is this error, which uh, grows polynomial with system size. So if you want to make this error epsilon small, you have to ex take the depth which scales polynomial with system size. And if you remember at the very beginning, I tried to argue that we want some problems which we can simulate with constant or at most logarithmic depth. Therefore, uh, we want to... Um, try to find the problem where we can do this tutorization without 
this huge error. And side problem exists. It's um, time periodic dynamics. So what I do, I take each term in, uh, coefficient in front of each term, and I quick, uh, quick question. Sorry, there. <clears throat> Thanks for all the questions, folks. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to skip a few just in the interest of time. We can try to bring them up at the end. So please do remember them, and we can resurface them at the end. Uh, maybe two quick questions for you here, Oles. Um, uh, just as what boundary conditions do you have? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, I have open boundary conditions, meaning that the the leftmost and rightmost qubits they are not connected to anything else. Okay. Um, and um, Roni, we'll get to your question at the end. Uh, it just quick reminder, what's lambda again? Oh, lambda is just a constant. So as the same as H and J and H, we we, 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 in some cases, we put it zero if we want to look at this non-interacting limit. And sometimes we keep it uh, constant, uh, some constant to, to explore how interacting system behaves. All right. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, great. Thank you very much for questions. And so um, I will be, I will focus on, on Hamiltonian, which is where I put H, J, H and Lambda being time dependent. And this time dependent shown this plot. So I first switch on H, next I switch on J, and next I switch on uh, lambda. So in that way, this is a physical dynamics, it corresponds to physical evolution. But at times u equal n times t, where t is a period, I can express it as an application of um, a unitary, we call the Floquet unitary, n times. And this each Floquet unitary will be a the same our trotterized version uh, of evolution where we apply the z term, x term, and z term. And the circuit for implying single Floquet unitary is, looks like here. It's a local circuit. Um, and what's notable here, we don't have this nasty error which we will have to deal with. So we for finite number of n, we get a finite depth circuit so that's why using studying this periodical driven system is more beneficial rather than using continuous dynamics however when one one may ask question whether or not we have my other modes in the system right because we, we change the problem and apparently uh we have even richer dynamics with time periodic systems so that's how the phase transition look like uh phase diagram look like for static system so if h larger than j we have a phase transition between topological phase with Maya and zero mode and trivial modes. However, in the time periodic system, the dynamics is, is more, 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 even more rich and more, more complicated. So let me just quickly introduce you to that. So here, this phase diagram shows you dynamics for system with uh, zero interactions. So I put Lambda to zero. And in this case, I would have a trivial phase, which doesn't have any Maya modes. I have a, a phase with a single Mayana zero mode, similar to what I have in a in, in, oh, single, sorry, pair of Mayana modes, what I have in static system. And this corresponds to operator gamma S, where S corresponds to left or right, which commutes with, with my Floquet unitary. And it, it's similar to gamma S, which commutes with my Hamiltonian. Also, interestingly enough, I have additionally a phase, which is shown here red, which exhibit what we call Mayana Pi mode, which anti-commutes with a Floquet unitary. This possibility we don't have in, in Hamiltonian dynamics. It's completely new type of Mayana modes existing in, 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 in periodical driven system. And we're going to explore them both because I think they both are very, very interesting objects. So everything we talk here are about non-interacting system. Um, so if we take interactions, this phase diagram slightly change. Um, but what's importantly that that interaction makes um, the Mayan mode um, decaying. Um, so in general, this, for example, if we take M0 mode, its commutation relation with with uh, with Floquet interior will be true up to some small parameter, one of tau, which means that your, your, your uh, time evolution of this gamma s, if we think about Heisenberg picture, will, will decay, your, your, it will not be conserved quantity. 
So in these experiments, we have to be very careful to choose a depth such that we uh, don't exceed this decay time. Hopefully this decay time is very, very long and we have theoretical work showing this. Sorry, that's the decay of? Of, my, of, of the mode. So uh, you see here, here we see this, this mode. So, so what, what's, what's remarkable about this mode, it's conserved in time. So because it commutes with UF, as you apply more and more layers of evolution, your operator gamma S or any observable associated with gamma S will not, will not decay. However, if you have interactions, what happens that uh, because you, it's not exactly commutes with, with your okay, unitary, your, your signal from your Mayana modes will decay with time. And that's what something you want to, um, uh, you, you want to avoid. So you have to choose depth of circuit, which is smaller than the key time. Gotcha. And what sets tau? Uh, tau is a, a lifetime. Um, so you have to do additional two, um, two uh, notions. So tau is um, something which says how, how, how many layers, in, in how many layers your Mariana mode decay. And we want tau to be as large as possible. And we, we have a, with my, my colleague, which we, with him, we, 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 we uh, wrote this paper. We, we have a work showing that the tau Increase exponentially with one over lambda, where lambda is a, where lambda is a uh, interaction constant. So if lambda is small, uh, usually the style can be like hundreds of thousands of cycles, and we we shouldn't care about that. But it's important to note that it's possible that we have to have to keep keep in mind that this mode can be can be decaying. Great. Um, yeah, and I guess that's with Ramis. Hello, Ramis. And um, can you just remind us, there, there's a question here. Could you just remind us real quick what theta and phi angles are? Oh, yeah, sure. So theta, theta here is an angle for, give me a just quick jump to the previous slide. Uh, so our theta is the um, angle corresponding to x, x gate. So, and our phi is angle corresponding to a z, a z gate. Thank you very much. So if, phi is equal zero, we have only x, x gate applied. So it's, um, we always act in x basis. And if we have a, a phi zero theta, we have only z, z, z term. So um, this limit can be, can be seen as kind of uh, Eisen model, and this would can be seen as, as just decoupled givable set of qubits. I see. So back to, to, I guess, to your question. So tau is the, decay lifetime due to that interaction of the ZZ term, which yes. maybe goes exponentially with uh, with the um, in, interaction strength. Yeah, one, one over interaction strength. One yeah. over interaction strength. And uh, and then capital T? Oh, capital T is our driving period. Uh, sorry, I mean, there's a question here. Great. Uh, so capital T is, um, so you, you imagine uh, basically evolution where after Time t, you repeat your your sequence. So t here is a is a drying period. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Okay. So our goal is is to take this operator gamma and you know try try to to extract it. And that is a little bit formidable problem because uh, gamma s is a matrix which has size two n by two times the n two two times n, uh, two to the n two to the n. So it's it's a huge matrix. But we are going to simplify our life and uh, just represent it as a what they call Taylor expansion over this elementary operators gammas we had. And each gamma, if you remember, it's a string, string of Pauli's. And um, in, 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 in condensed matter physics, there is a nice um, description of gamma as a dressed, dressed uh, quasi particle. It means that it's a single, excita single electron excitation, single fermion single gamma excitation like this, plus uh, some terms which correspond to collective motions. And this collective motions in some sense address your, your excitations. But what, what's interesting is that, that these terms, like higher terms, they, they uh, appear only in the case of, um, of uh, non-zero lambda, non-zero ZZ interactions. So if we have no ZZ interactions, we always have only first term, which is very nice. We know that we can describe our gamma only using Psi. 
While if we have this term, there is a reasonable assumption they these terms are not very large. So we can have a lot of information of gammas just measuring uh, only uh, psi, psi s. And just remember, psi s is a, it's just side, it's left or right. So we, so psi s here stands for right Majorana mode and left Majorana mode. <clears throat> and our goal is to try to measure them. And to do so, uh, we will need to make an assumption, additional assumption is that um, Majorana modes are only localized modes of the system. And what it means mathematically is just, we don't have any other operators which have, say, this form where terms are uh, spatially concentrated in some, in some region. So here's the, the picture, this picture uh, shows you difference between localized and delocalized modes. So in localized modes, these coefficients like psi s, they are nearly picked while in delocalized modes they depict. And we believe that all other modes, if they exist in systems, they delocalized. And if this assumption is true, so here's the, the algorithm, how we can extract our psi s. Um, we first, we initialize our system in a state, which is direct product of plus states. Plus state is an eigenstate of X operator, which means that this psi zero is uh, equal superposition of all bit strings, right? Next, we apply n cycles of uf. So the circuit looks like here. We So this Hadamard's initiate in the plus state. So next we have n cycles of our Floquet unitary. And at the end, we measure expectation. So basically of this gamma mu operator, this is a Pauli string operator. And it's a separate story how we do me how we measure it. It's interesting. I would like not spend all much time. You may think about just if you measure a long Pauli operator, you can just do sampling and look at different values, plus minus ones for all these operators and X operators and collect the statistics. Um, and then at the end, you, 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 you can repeat this procedure n times and you take a, what, what I would call a Fourier transform of this uh, local observable, of this observables ON. So, and once you, you do it, you can use a formula we derived in our paper, which connects uh, this psi L, this uh, wave function, and L is here is for left mode. And there is a reason why we, we, we think about this left mode with, 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 the, um, uh, with the F. So for MZM mode, your psi L will be uh, zero frequency for your trans, this with zero frequency for your transform, and for uh, pi mode will be through the pi frequency for your transform. So now let's explain why we, we have left mode. And this relates to the fact that when we use the our Jordan Wigner transformation, we take it from the left qubit. So if you want to compute right modes, you have to do the same thing, but from the right edge. That will give you right modes. <clears throat> so here are the uh, simple experiment. Uh, performed on uh, IBM Toronto device. And in this simple experiment, we measure F1. So we measure um, Fourier transform corresponding to gamma one, which is a minor operator X on the leftmost qubit. And we start, so, so, so yeah, uh, sorry, this, this, uh, this plot shows you dependence of this Fourier transform frequency and the angle phi, which modulates the Z, Z term, the interaction, the, uh, Z gate strength. And we start deeply in the uh, MZM phase. And you see, oh, I'm sorry, you see uh, this signal from F has a very, very sharp peak at the at the zero frequency. And this peak is very, very similar. If you remember, I showed the beginning, this zero bytes peak in solid state experiment. I think it's a direct analogy of this experiment. So you see this sharp peak. And this chart peak means that you have a localized mode which overlaps with the first qubit, uh, so non-zero psi. <clears throat> and then from amplitude, you can actually derive psi. And, and then when, when you move from this localized phase into trivial phase, you see the signal rapidly vanishes, getting it into some fluctuations. And when we enter MPM phase, you see that the frequency pi will get a sharp uh, rising sharp peak 
which correspond to our pi mode. And I think it's very exciting. So this is a real experiment. And this, I think the first reliable, I mean, maybe, yeah, it's first reliable actually uh, measuring of such such uh, such uh, peaks on, 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 on uh, quantum hardware. Uh, maybe someone asked why we have two peaks and the sample is, the answer is simple. Our frequency is actually defined from minus pi to pi and it's periodic. So here, just to make a picture consistent, I continue this uh, beyond minus pi to pi. So we can imagine it repeats with period of pi. Therefore, these two peaks are actually single peak. <clears throat> okay, um, now let me show in general how this psi look like if we measure them in the bulk. So uh, we tune in the middle of uh, topological zero mode. So here's this plot shows you dots, which are experimental data from 10 qubits, um, 10 qubits, um, I guess this is also MBM Toronto device. I need to double check. Um, <clears throat> and lines here show these theoretical predictions. And you see how nicely these theoretical predictions and, um, um, and, 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 and theory are aligned with each other. And, and one of the reasons why with this nice uh, correspondence is that uh, when you do Fourier transform, it's kind of self average the noise. So even if you have a noise device in our device, which is inevitably present, it's after after many rounds of this uh, Fourier transform, it just get, goes away. <clears throat> and in similar measurement you can do with uh, pi modes. So we, if we tune in the middle of pi mode, oh, by the way, I, sorry, I didn't mention this. So this is basically um, our F or uh, which is both uh, um, as a function of frequency and position. So this indicates the frequency at which it happens. So this this mode happens in zero frequency. And if we tune up in the middle of uh, uh, MPM phase, we can see this two nice curves corresponding to pi frequency, which which again gives us information of this mode. So both of these plots are done for lambda equals zero. And as a last uh, plot, we can plot for lambda is pi over 16. Um, and in this case, you see that uh, the shape of it changes a little bit. And But still, if you compare it to a uh, noiseless circuit, which the solid, R, the solid lines are, you can still very good correspondence. So we, we basically extracted these Mayana modes from the device, and we, we get pretty good correspondence to theory. <clears throat> And in, in, in general, uh, let me, it, it's a basically a very theoretical page. I will just try to give you spirit because it's very, very powerful techniques that can apply a variety of problems. And before we dive into that, all this, a few quick clarifying questions here from the audience. Um, first, uh, how many qubits were in the experiment? So we have, in this experiment, we have 10 qubits. We have actually experiments for 21 qubits as well. But um, actually, because these modes are localized, you can increase the system size without uh, sacrificing a much the shape of the curve. So the, the, the device has 27 qubits, but we take a sequence of 10 qubits for this particular case to give this, make this very, very clear picture. I see. And you show us the, the, soon the, um, the, the bigger one. Um, great. And I think there was a quick question about, is n periodic? Why do you use the Fourier transform? But I guess that goes back to to this whole idea of how you can't, uh, how this this has a better uh, simulation ability than the Suzuki trotter. Well, uh, no. So Suzuki trot. So you see, uh, when you do Suzuki trotter, trotter, uh, I think there is another way to look at it. When you do Suzuki trotter, you actually implement this time periodic dynamics. You just don't know it. And you you are you are, you are, you treat the difference between time periodic dynamics and uh, and um, uh, your continuous evolution as an error. So here I what we do we say let's forget about continuous dynamics. We'll probably when our devices become better we can come back to continuous dynamics. But for now let's focus just time periodic dynamics because it is as interesting as continuous dynamics. Or sorry maybe maybe I didn't understand the question. 
Um, no, I, I, th I think I think that maybe that does address it quite quite well. Uh, it's a it's an interesting connection. I think it was underappreciated by me at least. Uh, um, sure. And quick uh, final question here: is, How is this uh, actual circuit or simulation similar to the Ising model in the circuit setting, uh, or different? What's the difference between the two, apart from the way we process the results? Uh, actually, uh, there is no difference. So this is uh, this is Ising model basically a simulation, and the reason why we uh, interpret interpret it as a as a Kitaev model, fermionic model, is because when we do um, measurements here, we measure in this non-local basis. So uh, I give you a very, very, very I, I hope it's not very confusing analogy is that you can think about uh, quantum computing as application gates and measuring in local basis, right? So basically measuring um, local basis. But you may also think about like in Heisenberg picture, you can think about uh, quantum computing as initiating system in trivial state and measuring this non-trivial basis where you transform all the measured quantities with your circuit. So uh, uh, there's two equivalent way. You may, you may think about Schrodinger, Schrodinger way about quantum computing. You may think about Heisenberg way of quantum computing. And Heisenberg way is just looking on trivial zero state with all these complicated measurements. So this kind of kind of both, you, are, you implement the, the Eisen model but then you look at this Eisen model in a very like interesting twisted way, such that what you see is actually a prediction for uh, uh, for Mayana model. I hope it's not very confusing, but uh, I think this, this is more or less correct interpretation of this. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Thank you. And uh, maybe I'll just highlight very quickly that I think this was, um, yeah, this is very interesting because you say, you know, indeed this, you know, is this really the, is the first reliable measure of a Majorana zero mode peak on quantum hardware, right? That's, that's, uh, that's really exciting. It's a big deal. Yeah, so uh, I just, to make credit, uh, I didn't put links here, but to make credit, uh, there were a few simulations and photonic system where we realized Eisen model and see some oscillations at the edges where uh, we can, can attribute to uh, zero mode. So we can say that nobody first simulated Eisen model, but I think we first who are actually able to extract this this curves and compare to theory and give this claim that this modes actually look like a Mayana modes it's not um, some accidental resonances that somebody can uh, confused with my mode so just uh to, to give a credit to people who did it before a uh, similar system before <clears throat> would you call that extracting the weight function in a sense or yeah, I, I I call it extracting. So uh, in a sense that I I if I have this operator, I actually get get this first first term from this uh, for this decomposition. In this way, I get actually a pretty good representation of what this my mode is, and and actually it's it's yeah it's a very good strong evidence. Thank you very much. So and, and let me um I don't have I believe don't have much time but I I just want to make a very quick slide maybe somebody if maybe very not interested in in theory can skip it but I think it's very interesting technique so every time you have a some localized mode of the system which is I call delta here and delta square equal to one you can use Fourier transform to extract the delta using if you have access to observable O so yeah so you have a pair you have uh local integral of motion, you have observable O. And if you do procedure we did before, you initialize state and perform Fourier transform, the limit when you take D to be very, very large, um, it's always equal to overlap between your uh, mode and observable times the expectation of the uh, your integral of motion in respect to initial state. So, and this is, I think if uh, somebody will ask, uh, to highlight the main theoretical contribution of our paper is basically will be this formula. And using this formula, you can always uh, extract if um, some information about overlap between your uh, integral of motion and uh, your observable if you design specific uh, initial state. <clears throat> and in our case, our O is just gamma mu, and uh, we know that uh, the overlap between uh, 
integral of motion and gamma mu is our psi s. But you, you can work, do it for more, more general set of problems. It's, it's, it's a very exciting technique. Um, okay, um, I, let me just quickly show you the new method of braiding, and probably that will be it. And there's also interesting part related to distinguishing topological and trivial nodes. And, uh, but uh, I think it's not as maybe as important as, as braiding. So <clears throat> at the beginning, I told you that braiding is, 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 a, is a way to swap to position of two Mayana modes. And what you do, you implement some maybe slow evolution that uh, takes left mode and converts it into right mode and takes right mode and converts it into left mode. And schematically, you can write ux as, as a function of a gamma left and gamma right, but in real life, you cannot construct it in this way because you basically don't know what gamma left and gamma right is in your system. You have um, even, even in principle, even if you can derive it from the technique we did before, that will be a little bit hard to construct in a near-term quantum device. So we, we propose an alternative way to construct such a map or approximate the map. And let me explain the next slide. So we construct a non-unitary evolution in this form. And what is non-unitary evolution? It's, it's very similar to our uh, Fourier transform. By the way, I need to mention that this works only for zero modes, not for pi modes. Um, so if you want to pi modes, you need to pull factor here. But uh, you construct uh, such a map where un are <clears throat> is, is, a, is a procedure what you see on the right. You apply Floquet evolution for n cycles. And the same what we did for in the previous slides is uh, basically n time applying this for, for layer four circuit. Then you perform a exchange of physical, what we call physical Mayana modes. That's our Pauli strings, if you remember. And to implement this, you, need, you can do it uh, relatively easy. Um, and then you, you do another round of like evolution. <clears throat> so th this is no unitary map, it looks a little bit scary um, because it's non-unitary, but uh, nothing scary about this map is, uh, there is. Uh, you, you can implement it just by, every time you do round of um, evolution and, and measurement, you just toss a coin, uh, which gives you number from zero to D minus one, and then you implement unitary corresponding to this coin. So implement this evolution as, as simple as implementing um, uh, unitary evolution. <clears throat> and we, we show that, um, so I hope it sounds not very, very, very technical, but there are some connect conditions such that first your system is reflection symmetric and your psi L1, which is our magnitude of your Mayana mode, is larger than one or square root of two, and it can be real without loss of generality. Then the action of this map, which parameterized by this angle alpha, it acts almost the same as your free fermion, oh, sorry, uh, so as your uh, Mayana exchange, unitary Mayana exchange. Um, and for that, you need to have, to have a very specific value of alpha. Oh, I forgot to put it here, but there is a very specific value of alpha. And this alpha can be derived ther either theoretically or it can be estimated using this wave function. On, I will show you that you can do it also variationally. But exists such value of alpha. And, and what's important is this factor p. And this factor p is um, something which is smaller than 1. And oh, sorry. Um, here should be minus sign. I'm, I'm sorry, but this, this is a mistake is formal. This, so it will be two this minus one minus this expression. Okay, we will post the link to the archive paper in the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was, was quick about editing this part. Um, so this p is smaller than one, and what it results in is a basical damping the signal. So your 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 signal from Mariana will be a little bit smaller, and that's that's the only price you pay. But the benefits is is great. You are to do so, you can do it on near term quantum computer. And you don't need adiabaticity, and you can do it one dimension. So let me briefly show uh, the result of the uh, of the of the um, braiding. So if you look on the right, it's a sm small simulation for five qubit device. So what you see on the left is a, the same as the previous experiment. So here I'm 
uh, instead of taking absolute value as we did in the um, in the beginning, we 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 keep the sign of the wave function. So that's why it looks a little bit different, but it's the same experiment we did before. And what's on the see on the right is the result for braided mode. And how we do the braided mode, we perform the same steps as we did for unbraid, uh, unbraided mode, but we replace our Floquet evolution with our braiding evolution. And that should produce us wave function, which will be a wave function of, braided, of the braided mode. And you can see that, you can easily check that your left mode is exactly the same as, uh, so if you, if you try to more technically uh, measure left mode, you, it looks like right mode. And if you measure right mode, it gets as a, looks like as a left mode, which gives you a um, technically action of two Mayana modes. And um, you can <clears throat> also, Derives the angle you need it for. So, so the angle we did in previous slide is derived from theory. Just we because we we know everything about the system, we can derive angle. But another question, another another um, way to construct the cost function is look uh, the diff, the another way to find this angle is minimize the cost function that measures the quality of the braiding, and that. Um, that is basically the difference between uh, right mode and left braided left mode. And uh, what you see on the right is uh, how this loss function depends on angle alpha. Sorry, this will be angle alpha. And uh, as you see, uh, this loss function always has a minimum corresponding to the perfect braiding, and this minimum pretty close to the theoretical prediction, which uh, allows us to do it for device for which we don't know the 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 precise formulation, precise, precise Hamiltonian on how it looks like. <clears throat> okay, um, Zlatko, tell me please, how much time do you have? I, I okay, we can go a few minutes over. So if you'd like to give us kind of a brief, um, yeah, a yeah, brief uh, overview of this. Give me a just brief, uh, brief, brief uh, description how topological and trivial modes can be distinguished and people who are interested can look in the paper. And the idea is that, as, as you explained at the very beginning, you can have a problem that you can generate some uh, non-topological modes due to some imperfections. For example, you can get fairly pretty a rare situation when your, for example, first qubit is disconnected from the rest of qubits. And if you say you are, get this qubit uh, such that it does, it's disconnected from the rest of qubit and has no, no gate applied to it, it would look like as you have a two integrals of motion, two, two, two modes sitting on this qubit. So it would correspond to X operator and gamma operator. And that will create a situation when you have, instead of NZM, you have one mode on the left and one on the right. You have a situation you have two modes on the left and two modes on the right. And the same situation happens in actual and solid state devices. So it will be very interesting to construct a way how to distinguish the case we have these two modes and one mode. And um, to, to do so, you, you measure what is called a two-point correlation function. So instead of single gamma, you measure two gammas. And just brief, briefly uh, to show experiment, in trivial mode, you have two peaks. You have a bright peak on the, uh, so you, 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 you kind of measure the correlation function between first qubit and qubit in the middle. And um, the two, two function, the point function would look like differently from for trivial case and the topological case. And maybe you can get more details uh, from the paper about this. <clears throat> so let me go to conclusions. Uh, we demonstrated detection of Mayana modes in the uh, this devices. Uh, we developed a new non-diabatic braiding technique and the method to the separating Mayana modes from trivial modes. And, and this, this problem has a lot of extensions. You can do two-dimensional topological systems you can try to model realistic Hamiltonians uh, that correspond to devices uh, people, uh, scientists try to implement to for topological quantum computing. Uh, you can study other systems with localized integrals of motion. Say the many, this is a phenomenon called many body localization. Uh, you can test different qubit encodings. And the most important <clears throat> uh, 
I think the one of the big challenges is probably to implement a what we call fermionic quantum computing, where each qubit is encoded with not with the bosons as we have now, but with fermions. And if we if we if we do this, we can use now that all the techniques we do for actual topological quantum computing. But it's I don't I mean not, now we we're still far from this point for many reasons, but in the future it will be very interesting uh, direction. As a last slide, I would like to thank our team. Uh, uh, all experiments uh, on hardware were done by our uh, summer intern, Nikhil Harley, for, who is now undergraduate at TL. Also, I would like to thank Ramiz for uh, his, uh, our, I mean, our equal contribution to, to this paper. Um, all experiments were done with Kiskit. And I want to mention one thing. Uh, months later of our publication, there was another publication for from a major experimental group from Google AI, who did also very similar experiments uh, on their device, which is closed. And you can look at the list of authors, and from this look, look at authors, uh, in comparison for our small team, you maybe can learn an interesting lesson that uh, using cloud-based quantum computing uh, these days, it's probably sometimes possible to do world-class experiments comparable to world-class uh, experimental groups, just with less resources and uh, um, le 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 with less, less people and uh, still get very interesting physical fundamental results. Um, yeah, <laughs> you want to say something? Start yeah, I want to say, uh... Uh, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation and for the um, wonderful talk. We're going to get to questions now, but yes, congratulations on the result. I particularly find it uh, really awesome and exciting, and um, I think it's significant to have a you know a first quantum demonstration on quantum hardware of uh, these Majorana elusive Majorana zero modes that have been you know uh, uh, had a lot of experiments in in different technologies that haven't been conclusive or have had to be retracted even um, and to be able to really kind of use this even to debug and understand deeper the physics and see the the modes is is I find that really cool that's really awesome uh, so congratulations to you uh, Ramis who's on the call here and he's in the chat unfortunately he's having problems posting in the chat there's some technical issues so hopefully we'll resolve that and Nikhil um, there are a lot of questions uh, so I think that speaks to the interest in the work uh, folks, if I missed your question, now is a great time to repost it. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll try to get to these one by one. Um, let's see, where do we begin? Uh, all right, so uh, maybe the first question was about the experiments and the kind of, uh, how ex how did you decompose that uh, those rotations, RxX, RzZ? Uh, was that one CX gate, two CX gate? Was it using a native cross resonance gate or a uh, native CX gate, if you could speak to that a little more. Yes, of course, it's a, a very good question. So, and with your, let me go, jump onto this part of presentation. If you want to, um, if you want to implement uh, such a gate, so you can implement this part of HXX as a two layers, right? And each layer will implement Individual x x rotation for two qubits. I, I, I hope it's 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 um it's clear. And this uh, each such a gate will require two uh, c knots. Um, and the way how we did it, we just basically used a native um, native tool from Cascade. So if you are, uh, ask Cascade to transpile a gate, it will provide you a best decomposition. And uh, knowing that we can implement it with two uh, two C nodes, we, we we can actually visually check that this decomposition is 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 good, and then using this decomposition, we can construct a circuit. Um, that's how we did it. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, thank you, Alice. Folks, feel free to follow up on that. Um, it, could you tell us about the lifetime of the Majorana zero modes? Was that computed? You know, how did that compare here? We, we talked about tau and t earlier. Uh, if uh -huh. you can bring that back to the experiments. Yeah. So uh, this lifetime. So this uh, I, I mentioned. Oh, sorry. Um, I mentioned this lifetime, tau, um, and this lifetime for most most experiments it definitely depends on lambda. 
So uh, I think the lifetime is largest one, largest if you are sitting on the edges of this phase diagram. So it basically diverges, it become, so, sorry, um, um, uh, let, uh, discard this. So assuming you have this phase diagram for free from in, for uh, non-interacting system and you add, add lambda, so the lifetime will be largest if you are start from the edges of this phase diagram. So, and I think it's it's actually, uh, yeah, it becomes exponential large with one over lambda. So in our experiments, we see pretty little decay. In, uh, so we use a few dozens of periods, uh, of, so a few dozens uh, of, of locate evolution cycles. And for that, even for the depths, we didn't see much decay. So this decay happens much, much, much later. Uh, I don't have a particular number, <clears throat> but even if you uh, sit, so we, we have lambda, oh, sorry, we have um, lambda to be like pi over 16, or no, sorry, we, we, um, not lambda, we had this uh, angle phi correspond to this rotation as pi over 16. And this, uh, this angle as, um, has a very, very little evidence. But I think that it's, it's important to mention this because it might be very important for maybe larger devices and deeper depths. Um, so it's it's very important um, <clears throat> quantity to pay attention to. Um, thank yeah, thank you, Alice. Um, from Leonard, could you maybe briefly comment on the non-local measurement? Because it seems that like that's where the magic happens in terms of the difference between the Ising model and the Kitaev model. Oh, of course. So um, assuming you want to, so you want to measure this, this string. So there are two ways to do so. And one way is uh, when you run the circuit, you measure Z1 on the first qubit, Z2 in the second qubit and so on, and YK, YK in the last qubit. Then you multiply the results of measurement. This result measurement will be plus minus one. And you multiply them. And then you repeat the experiment many, many, many times. And in that case, when you uh, get the expectation, you will get the expectation for this operator. So it's relatively simple. So it, there is another way to do so. Um, and let me, I guess I have a technical slide. Uh, this is how we do it. It's slightly different. We, um, we uh, implement some circuit kind of li like this. So uh, before measuring, uh, instead of measuring all qubits, we apply a series of gates and measure one qubit. And we choose a series of gates such that when we measure a single qubit here, it will represent uh, the strong, the long string. Um, so, um, and uh, we found that this method better um, because it appears to be applying two qubit gates and the devices we worked has smaller errors than making measurement. So in both cases, you have a problem that if you have a measurement on a single qubit, that will give us another error, which multiplies as you get longer and longer string. And we found that if we take apply gates, uh, that gives us smaller error than if we perform a set of measurements. So we, we stick to this procedure. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, you have to do yeah this this uh, this very non-local operation, and that what no solid state device can can actually do. So uh, it's very interesting that in general, if you are want to, sorry, um, want to do measures this observable um, and say you have, instead of your programmable computer, um, you have, you have a, for, um, some many body system, like physical many body system, it will be very, very hard to measure these operators. That's where uh, this quantum device is very powerful. Uh, get get the power. Um, yeah, that's very cool. You can't you can't do that uh, very easily in. The... Yeah. So, for example, uh, on cold atoms, um, I think measuring this operator will be very very hard. Or in in, in literally any architecture, uh, that will be very challenging. Uh, um, question from Narendra: How do you deal with the non-adiabatic excitations? 
or maybe it's a question about the non-adiabaticity piece of the protocol. Right. So the idea that uh, we we don't use a so th th this this action is kind of doesn't um, doesn't um, um, it, it, it kind of lies in in, in different in, in different it does per, per, performs the break in a different way. It's not. It's very. I don't know if if we can understand it uh, as a kind of extension of uh, adiabatic way. So I'm not sure how to answer this question. Um, so I think it's that, this proposal in particular, right? Yeah. So we 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 just um, we use a technique which I call filtering, which where this uh, Floquet evolution it's kind of filters uh, filters this uh, act swap of the uh physical Mayanas in, in converse into basically so so it take convert takes this unitary and converts in, into this kind of unitary and and that will involve no no diabeticity so in principle if you are, have a power to implement such a unitary somehow to construct it you don't have issues with uh no diabetic excitations or the type of problems which you have a diabetic uh adiabatic case the problem is you don't know how to do it you are um you just even if you have no information about gammas constructing such a unitary will be very very hard so and what we do we just kind of approximate this unitary by implementing um uh, this using this filtering technique which is a little bit different from adiabatic technique <clears throat> Awesome, thank you. A uh, question from earlier from Roni Wink. Uh, is there an analogy between braiding of logical qubits in the surface code and the Majorana mode braiding, or what would be the difference between? I, um, so in surface in surface code, I mean, both both case in uh, Majorana mode in Majorana code, what we'll what, what, what call Majorana code, and um, in surface code, uh, we, we we can't perform uh, quantum information by by uh, operation with with the particles. So in in surface code, we um, yeah I, th I think um, it, it is it is it is very very uh, similar. So just manipulating by the particles in surface code sitting in the at the edges, and in case of uh, Mayanas, it's a also sitting on the edges. You can somehow implement logical operations it's just two different a little bit different models and they have uh different ways how you will do this but the spirit is is pretty the same for those two models and maybe one-to-one -one comparison will be a bit hard because it will require a lot of drawing but the the, the idea i think uh are are, are very close to this um <clears throat> to surface code um sorry maybe I, i'm not answer the question, but uh... and Roni, feel free to clarify. Um, and oh wow, I see we're almost twenty minutes over. So folks, uh, maybe post any final quick question. I I definitely did not get to all the questions. I apologize for that. We can maybe have a uh, an email thread with uh, all this later. Um, with um, uh, with that, maybe for one final question, uh, let's see if, uh, feel free folks to repost now because I know I missed quite a few and I do see that Roni is still with us, which is great. Um, can you maybe just uh, go back to the slide on the um, dressing and uh, just remind us about, or is there a renormalization here? I think this is the question. Um, if you could repeat what you mean here by the dressing in this case. Oh, the, um, uh, so in, in this case, dressing means that basically your uh, Mayana mode is a um, collective excitations. Excitation, it cannot be understand. So if you think about this model, a fermionic model, um, you cannot understand this uh, gamma S as a just uh, superposition of single um, single uh, fermions, you 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 need have to think about it as a just generic uh, collective motion of uh, of uh, myonafermions, of this physical myonafermions, which um, 
which a, 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 a technical house of electron and um well so we we, we, we call it uh dressing because uh we can think about a single silly mayana and basically as a mayana um kind of i would say dancing dancing around um contributing to collective motion so you are asking a question about your normalization and i'm not sure i understand the, this question as uh, may you help me with this uh um, I think it was a question about renormalization and, and Vector, feel free to clarify and, and expand here. Uh, and I, I think, you know, they're asking oftentimes in these dress states or questions, sometimes you have this renormalization, renormalization groups. Um, I think it's a more general question if that comes into play here of needing to do some kind of, you know, if this expansion converges and so on. And then whether you need to renormalize that as a whole. I think that's the question. Feel free to clarify in the chat. Um, um, and I'm it sorry, sounds I'm like not, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I can give a satisfying answer to this. I I always thought, thought um, there's a lot of uh, th theoretical um, tools which are uh, related to normalization here. And um, 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 I, I think maybe we've we've touched on that enough for the moment, just in the interest of time. And um, also, I want to thank Ramis uh, in the chat for helping me cover some of these uh, questions, since there were indeed so many. So I think that's a testament to how interesting uh, your work is and how nice the results are. I want to congratulate you and the colleagues again on this uh, awesome results. And uh, thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, and I think with that, it's time that we end. So if you'd like any final words to share with us, Alice, before uh, we uh, end. I will just uh, thank everybody for, uh, for for this, for your attention. Please check uh, the paper on archive and uh, stay tuned. Awesome. All right, folks, thank you very much for all the questions. Um, sorry if we didn't get to all of them. Feel free to follow up with us. Um, Alice, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks for also the other authors tuning in. Uh, thank you, folks. And with that, this talk will stay recorded. Um, so you can go back and rewatch it uh, if you missed anything. And we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. <laughs>